Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's briefing. My name is Carol Werner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are very, very glad that you are here this afternoon uh, to be part of a whole discussion about how can we best go about advancing resiliency. There are a lot of opportunities that we're going to hear about this afternoon that will help communities, people across the country, as they look for ways to help their communities become more resilient, there are some, I think, really interesting opportunities that will allow um, uh, folks across the country in all sorts of areas that have been dealing with disaster after disaster that are really looking at needs for new developments and how can they best do it in a way that will make their communities much more resilient and of course that has huge impacts in terms of their ability to have uh, a safe, healthy, uh, local infrastructure that can survive economically, can prevent sort of the worst uh, damages, can really mitigate risk, can mitigate hazards. And I think across the country, states and localities are very, very interested in finding ways to deal with this. I know I was struck when we started to look at the numbers that in terms of, of areas that have been declared, presidentially declared disaster areas, in, the, in three years, in 2011, 2012, and 2013, that that included areas in 48 states and 19 other jurisdictions. That is pretty staggering. And so it really calls out the need for people to come together, look creatively for innovative ways that we can help move resilience activities forward. What does that mean? How can we best learn from each other in terms of helping uh, our uh, our sister communities across the country. And also make sure that the investments that we're making and that, that whether it's, it's private investment, local public investment, national investment, to make sure that this is really the smartest way because obviously there are always limited dollars, limited resources, limited time. And so what's, how do we do this in the most effective, the smartest way for everyone? So it's a real chance to learn from each other. So to hear more about some of these innovative approaches and competitions to try and bring out the most creative approaches and ideas, we have a wonderful panel this afternoon, and our leadoff speaker will be Sam Carter, who is the Associate Director for Resilience with the Rockefeller Foundation. Sam will talk a little bit more about the Rockefeller Foundation, what it's doing, and why it is so concerned with regard to resilience and finding ways to really mitigate some of these risks and hazards, uh, both domestically and, and frankly, uh, globally, uh, because Rockefeller has been in the lead in this whole area for, for a number of years in terms of its global look as well as its look domestically. And prior to coming to the Rockefeller Foundation, Sam had helped establish the Institute for Public Knowledge at, in, at New York University, where he was the associate director. And while there, he was developing a number of new program areas that allowed him to create new partnerships within a university setting as well as within New York City, but also in terms of global partnerships. And that, and in 2013, he was involved in terms of uh, developing and implementing the rebuild by design and was a project manager of the research stage of this important effort. And I think another interesting aspect about Sam's work has been that prior to his working with the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU. He had been with the Social Science Research Council uh, in, the, in the President's Office of, of the Research Council. And interestingly, while there, he worked on two books for the privatization of risk series. And that is a big part of some of the challenges that we are facing today uh, as we look across the country in terms of looking at all of the extreme events um, that have come in myriad forms that, that communities, that states have been dealing with um, uh, over the last few years. So, Sam?
Thank you very much, Carol, for that generous introduction. Thank you, Paul, for uh, your help in coordinating this. And really, thanks for EESI for setting up uh, occasions like this where we can have conversations like this because these topics fly around, there's these big ideas out there, and it's really important to be able to come together, explore these ideas, and think about what different uh, actors, organizations, and entities are doing in this space and how these things might inform one another. So I'm, I was really excited and eager to accept the invitation to come down. Thank you so much. Um, uh, oh, my slide's up. Um, just a, a quick note before I uh, get to my slides. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, for those of you who don't know, has been around for 101 years. This is our first year of our new century of work. Um, and we were really set up by the massive private fortune of a of a, uh, an entrepreneur and, a, and his family. Uh, and you know we've had a variety of different projects and, and large-scale initiatives that we've undertaken over the years. But um, for pretty much the last two decades, we've really been focused on how communities uh, of various scales can prepare for an uncertain future. Uh, and our work around resiliency uh, has really matured over the last decade with uh, uh, actually largely a lot of partnerships in Asia. Um, for many, uh, this is really the leading edge of a lot of the changes that are driven uh, by changes to climate. Um, and we've established about 10 years ago the Asian Cities Climate Change Resilience Network. Uh, and much of our maturing work in this space really does come from an international perspective and learnings from engaging with people all over the world. Um, and uh, I'm really just going to touch on sort of the front end of what all that great work has been for the last 101 years uh, and just describe sort of a set of projects that we've been doing uh, just over the last couple years. Another note. Uh, since I am going first, and since we're talking about a topic as uh, abstract for many as resilience, I think it's worth articulating a little bit about how the foundation uh, views resilience. Like, what does it mean to be resilient? How is it a useful construct? Uh, and I'll just sort of lead into that by suggesting that if you were to sort of have a spectrum, an axis, where on one end is, you know, a resilient place, um, or resilience, um, most people would think that the other end of that might be something like vulnerability or risk. Uh, but it's really important to understand that the other side, the antonym of resilience is collapse. And this is really about systemic collapse, complicated systems that overlay and intersect with one another. And how can these systems remain functioning, doing the things that they need to do to keep people safe to keep livelihoods happening in the face of all the different challenges and risks that we're going to face in the future. So I just want to sort of put that at the top of the conversation and we can come back to that um, in, uh, in Q&A or throughout, throughout our talks. Um, so uh, for the foundation in recent years, um, we've always been thinking big for, for, for many decades, um, but in this particular area, we really have an attitude uh, that's sort of summed up in this uh, Daniel Burnham quote. He's a famous Chicago architect. Make no little plans. They have no magic to stir people's blood and probably will not be realized. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and in work. And I bring this up because the challenges that we face in the future are really big and they're bigger than any one person, and it's very much about changing minds, it's about changing entire systems of the way we organize ourselves. At the end of the day, it's about shifting paradigms. Um, and that's not an easy task. It's not something that any one organization or even a small network of organizations can do. It's a massive collective action project. Um, and, and we think it's doable. We think it's already happening. There's a lot of leading indicators showing that people are taking steps in the right direction. But we think that when you're working with this kind of issue and these kinds of challenges, you have to think very big. And for the foundation in particular, whose mission is really to improve the well-being of humanity around the world, that's literally our mission. It's pretty big. Uh, but we have a focus on poor and vulnerable people around the world. Um, the question for us is how do you scale resilience? Because this is happening in places organically um, and, and maybe sometimes without much planning. It just sort of happens. People have to adapt. Um, how do you scale the best ideas uh, across, uh, across countries, across uh, jurisdictional lines, and ultimately around the world? Um, and that's 
That's really the challenge we've been taking very seriously at over the last five years. Um, the way that we've done this at the foundation is to take two specific, specific strategic tacks. The first is really um, a deep set of initiatives where it's really about catalyzing innovation and integration to reframe how key actors and actions work. This work is very much place specific. It has a heavy research component. Um, it's really about um, understanding the local conditions, the specific context, and designing solutions to meet those needs. And then we also have a broad set of solutions, and this is really about distributing the solutions that we pick up from around the world and influencing global debate and practice to land these uh, in different places. And the two real uh, tracks of work at the foundation are one that we call resilience by design, which is the work I'm going to focus on and, and what I'm responsible for at the foundation, and then 100 resilient cities. Uh, I'll say a couple words about 100 resilient cities. Um, it's, a, it's a global network. We announced our first 32 cities last year. Um, uh, we have a competition uh, each year. Uh, this was our, we just closed our second competition, and we'll have a third competition starting next year. Uh, it's really, the, the entry point for the competition is a city applies and they say we're doing X, Y, and Z and we're working towards achieving these goals. And then the best applications are selected and they become part of this network of mayors globally. Uh, in the United States we have, uh, I believe, six cities that were selected uh, in the first round, uh, depending on how you count them. Um, and um, these cities get um, uh, funds from the Rockefeller Foundation to hire uh, as staff position reporting to the governor, or, or sorry, reporting to the mayor, um, uh, a chief resilience officer. And this is a position we want more and more communities to pick up. Um, uh, and then we give them a set of tools and resources so that they can really develop a resilience building strategy over the next three years. Um, and we work with the community to sort of flesh out and articulate that strategy. Uh, and then we connect them to a set of private, uh, nonprofit. Uh, uh, but largely private sector partners who want to work with the city to really uh, implement the strategy. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the network effect of having lots of mayors, lots of chief resilience officers around the world that are sharing ideas. And that really embodies our, our broad set of solutions. But in terms of resili uh, resilience by design, um, this is really what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the presentation. As I said, it's really about tackling specific issues uh, and trying to change the way that we think about them in specific places. Um, and um, just to illustrate this point about how we need to change paradigms, I'll start off with the example of water, um, and in particular, coastal resilience. There's a set of challenges that we're very familiar with in this country with uh, the, the large storms that we've had in recent years that really underscore this issue. But if we can describe the sort of... Um, the old paradigm, which, uh, which has sort of brought us to this place that we're in right now, we might characterize it as pave, pipe, pump, and prevent. And what that means is, you know, we've created a set of largely engineering-based interventions and a lot of policy interventions as well that have allowed the urbanization of delta and coastal cities. This has created new land. You know, we've been able to develop. This, this creates wealth. Um, but it, unfortunately, has also a whole set of unintended consequences, not least our increased risk of devastating floods, subsidence. It's contributed to climate change because of the way that we've developed. It's led to, in many neighborhoods, social isolation and inequality. Um, and there's also a tremendous amount of ecological damage that's resulted from this paradigm. Um, and just to illustrate this for you, this is uh, an image from a catastrophic flood event. Um, it's from uh, a flood in New Orleans, actually connected to uh, Hurricane Katrina, but it's sort of irrelevant uh, what the image is. What it, or what the context is, because it's, it, it, it's, it's illustrative of this paradigm. There was a large wall that has clearly been breached catastrophically, uh, and uh, what that wall enabled was the construction of many homes putting very real lives in danger right on the other side of that wall. Because the second you build that wall, you're saying to that community, you're safe. At least, at least to, a, to a certain, in an engineer's mind, you're safe to a certain accepted level of risk. You know, uh, in a 100-year flood or a 500-year flood, which are problematic terms as well. But, you know... Once you build that wall there, it says, okay, developers come in, let's build some houses, let's have more homes, people start up lives, they get comfortable, they get safe, and then a catastrophic event happens and people lose their lives. And our argument is it doesn't have to be this way. This represents a particular paradigm 
of how we do urban planning and how we do urban design and how we build our cities. There are other ways to think about this. Um, and we sort of characterize this at the foundation as a paradigm of living with water. And this is something that some communities have been doing historically for generations and generations. And they don't have catastrophic floods because they know how to build. They build in specific ways. And they build housing uh, construction in certain ways that, that lets the water come in, is adaptable, and lets them be a little bit more uh, flexible in how they work with it. Um, this is just an example from, uh, and again, this could sort of be from a variety of different projects. This happens to be from a rebuild by design uh, project uh, by the Interborough team uh, in Nassau County in New York. Um, and this uh, is essentially uh, another model, another way to do this work. Rather than having a you know, high protective wall with residential right behind it, uh, you have a you know, a small wall right there on the edge, which is enough to keep back regular day-to-day -day tidal flows, boat traffic, et cetera. A sloping coast, which actually doubles as a public amenity in parkland. There's a, a berm, which rises to an appropriate level of risk tolerance, depending on whatever the community decides is that appropriate level of risk tolerance. Um, uh, some additional uh, vegetation to also uh, help protect. Um, and then it slopes back actually into a wetland. This is actually the restoration of a natural wetland that was there before the development occurred. And it's actually that system, that layered approach to protecting, which enables a commercial development to, to uh, exist uh, behind it. And in fact, that commercial development in this model in large part subsidizes the construction of that park uh, and actually pays for a lot of the maintenance of it. This is a model that's been done over and over again in, with increasing frequency in different cities. Brooklyn Bridge Park in New York City is a great example of this. Um, and this is something that the foundation sees as embodying that next paradigm, that um, living with water. Uh, and there's a ton of different ways uh, this can be demonstrated, but this is just one slide. So I really just want to do a quick overview of four different projects that are within our portfolio of resilience by design. And I'll end on the National Disaster Resilience Competition, which is our uh, rapidly maturing partnership with HUD. Uh, it's, uh, there's an exciting set of events connected to that, and Harriet will talk a little bit more about that uh, after I finish my remarks. And we can talk more about what the foundation is doing to support that in the Q&A if you're interested. But I'll start with... Um, uh, a set of projects uh, that's tied to something called structures of coastal resilience. Each of these, uh, actually I should make a note, each of these are characterized by a particular set of ingredients. There's a, um, there's sort of a big idea, as I said, we're, we're sort of going deep in a particular place or a particular local condition, building off of research to really understand what's happening today and what's going to happen in the future, and then partnering with a federal agency or a set of agencies at state or local levels to really leverage not just their authority, but also their, um, their budgets and their resources to really implement these projects. So the role of the foundation is really to create the environment or sort of an innovation lab that enables good ideas to surface, and then work with our uh, agency partners to, to implement these ideas. Um, and all along the way, consulting and bringing the community in, because without doing that, it's just not a successful process. Um, uh, on the merits and also for political reasons. But so with structures of coastal resilience, this is really a partnership with the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, there's, there's ongoing dialogue with FEMA around flood maps on this as well. Um, but this is really taking as its scope of work the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study, which is ongoing. Um, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, is, as some of you might be aware, is, is the uh, the entity uh, in the United States that's responsible for coastal protection. Um, and what we wanted to do is look at particularly vulnerable communities that have a shared condition. And in the case of Norfolk, Hampton Roads area, Atlantic City, Jamaica Bay, and Narragansett, Rhode Island, these are um, back bay systems. Uh, they don't directly face the ocean. Most of them have some kind of barrier island protection in front of them. And they're incredibly susceptible both to pluvial and fluvial flooding, which is to say flooding that comes when it rains and flooding that comes from surge uh, or other kinds of storm events. Uh, and what affects surge is not just um, uh, the uh, you know, increases of sea level uh, resulting from a variety of factors, but also the sinking 
of land. Uh, and in particular, Norfolk is especially vulnerable in this respect. Um, and that's also, that also comes from the result of decades of building on uh, wetlands as well. So uh, in these particular uh, places, what we wanted to do was uh, team incredibly robust, really advanced modeling of future storm surge projections, which take into account a variety of different risk factors that extend into the future, um, and marry that with top-level design team support so that designers could work with the community with the best available scientific knowledge to produce really forward-thinking resilience building designs. Um, and so what, where we are in this process is there are preliminary designs for each of these four sites. Um, we're working with the uh, mayors and their staff and the city councils and the communities to really shape these designs and, and get everyone's buy-in and get people excited about it. And ultimately, this will become, uh, we hope, and that's why we're working with the core, you know, part of the core's plans for these places because they have to construct protective systems already, and if we can sort of work through their mandate and deliver good ideas to them, the opportunity is there to really keep these communities safe for a number of years. Um, changing course is another example of this kind of work. This is a partnership also with the Army Corps of Engineers, and in particular with the Port of New Orleans and the state of Louisiana. For those of you who might be familiar with um, the way uh, that Katrina has worked, or sorry, not, the way that the state of Louisiana has worked with New Orleans uh, since uh, Katrina and Rita and other events, uh, there's been a, a really amazing collaboration that's developed around developing a coastal master plan. There was a 2012 uh, master plan that was uh, the first such plan that was universally adopted by the legislature, which if you know anything about Lu uh, Louisiana is a real feat in and of itself. Um, but uh, one of the things that remained undesigned in that coastal master plan was how we were going to deal with the lower Mississippi course. Um, this is one of the most heavily trafficked uh, navigational bodies in the United States. It's uh, the most, if not uh, one of the most, if not the most active port in terms of gross tonnage in the entire country. Uh, you know, half the country's states feed their, uh, their economies through this port. Uh, it's vitally important to national security for all these reasons. Um, however, it's, it's incredibly exposed and the only way that you can allow the navigational channels to stay open at this point is to do continuous dredging and to really sort of hollow out the river, which creates these strange forces of nature that actually eliminate the sediment flow out to the marsh islands and are gradually eroding the coast of Louisiana. So in addition to sea level rise, you have this massive disruption uh, and disappearance of land on the, on the river delta. And it's actually happening at a rate of a football field an hour, uh, if you can believe that. It's massive. Uh, and if you take this thing out over time, it, it basically means Louisiana is going to be underwater and the whole thing's going to fall apart in the next 90 years. So the, the question is, how do, you, how do you work within these constraints? How do you partner with the port? How do you partner with navigation and the pilots of the barges? How do you work with the city to ensure the culture remains and the fisheries remain? Um, there's not a simple answer to this. That's why it hasn't been solved yet. But we think the competition model is actually a great way to surface good ideas and really get new thinking uh, on the way. So we actually did a national search. We identified eight teams that would, um, uh, and it's, it's multidisciplinary teams. These are teams that include researchers and engineers and hydrologists uh, forming, uh, most of them have six, seven, or sometimes even 10 or 12 different uh, private firms that come together to form these teams, research institutions as well, um, uh, to really take a look at this and say, what could we do? You know, how could we develop this over time? We received, uh, we had eight sort of semifinalist teams. We narrowed it down to three. Uh, and those three teams are now in an intensive design stage uh, that's ongoing. Um, and uh, we hope to get their final designs uh, in mid-2015. Um, and again, there's massive buy-in from all the stakeholders in the region because this is a problem that everyone recognizes and everyone wants to solve. And there actually is money to implement a lot of this stuff because of BP's Deepwater Horizon and other things like that. So there actually is an opportunity here to, to do something grand and to do something really great. 
Uh, Rebuild by Design, which, uh, as was mentioned in my introduction, I was a project manager for when I was at uh, NYU before I came to the foundation. This was a partnership with the foundation and HUD and other philanthropies to uh, do something similar to what we were trying to do in the other two uh, competitions I described. But in this case, massively rethink how we would do uh, disaster recovery uh, using HUD dollars uh, in the Sandy affected region. Um, traditionally, uh, disaster recovery funds flow to um, uh, states, largely governors, sometimes mayors, depending on the capacity of the place. Um, and there's a, you know, a real requirement to um, sort of use these funds to recover specifically around the disaster. Um, and what HUD had the leadership and the vision to do with Rebuild by Design was really articulate, well, let's take some of that money, in this case about a billion dollars, uh, and, com and compete it uh, across these communities that are eligible for these funds um, and, 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 and really see what they could do with a, if we turn our vision to making a more resilient uh, North Atlantic coast, and in particular the Sandy affected communities. Um, and so this led to another competition uh, which the foundation was able to support um, uh, with its more flexible dollars from philanthropy. Um, and that really was built out from uh, June 2013 through uh, April 2014, uh, resulted in six winning projects. Uh, and those projects were awarded $920 million, uh, which are currently in the process of, of flowing to those states and cities. Um, and I can talk more about that in Q&A if people have questions. But finally, the, just the last thing I want to mention, and then I'll turn it over to Harriet to really talk about what, what this really is. Um, uh, in, uh, over the summer, President Obama announced the National Disaster Resilience Competition. Um, this was a competition that is really built off of, in many ways, the successes of Rebuild by Design and the ability to organize communities and get great ideas out there. Um, and really scale that approach and that philosophy out across uh, the, the entire country, or basically the entire country. Um, as uh, Carol mentioned, uh, it, in the past three years, there have been 67 communities. Of those, it's 48 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and then 17 uh, other territories and communities who, are, uh, who had a nationally declared disaster. Um, uh, in the years 2011 to 2013. And so the opportunity is to bring that kind of innovative design thinking to all these communities that are all recovering from these disasters uh, and really inspire them to pick up the challenge and really rise to the challenge and think about how they might grow to become more resilient. And HUD, in organizing this as a competition, is really challenging them to compete, come up with great ideas. Uh, and the foundation, for our part, is really helping them develop their ideas through a, a set of technical assistance programs. Uh, we're running a set of uh, resilience academies that's really bringing the teams that are putting together the applications uh, to regional uh, you know, retreats and really working with them so that they're really thinking about these ideas. We're pairing them with experts that we have in our network. We're connecting them to the best ideas from our projects around the world. And we're really just trying to make everyone as successful as possible in, uh, in, in, in working with HUD through this competition. So I'll stop there um, and I'll turn it over to Harriet, uh, or actually Carol. Um, and. Uh, if you have any questions about all this material I just uh, threw out at you, just we can talk about it at the Q&A. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Sam. And I think there should be lots to talk about. And as Sam said, we're, we're now going to hear from Harriet Tregoni, who is the director of HUD's Office of Economic Resilience. And I have known Harriet, known Harriet's work for a lot of years, or I should say a number of years now. And I, I think that she is uh, the right person in the right place at the right time in terms of really looking at this whole issue about economic resilience. Uh, she, as, as Sam said, she's going to talk more about this whole competition to encourage innovation. But Harriet brings a lot of experience through local, her whole background in local government. 
I, I think every day we see evidence of some of her work as the director of the DC Office of Planning in terms of how to create greater sustainability, uh, walkability, accessibility, livability here in the district. Uh, and as part of that, rewriting the city's zoning code for the first time in 50 years. But before that, she was also uh, director of the planning office for the state of Maryland, where, again, looking at a lot of the challenges that were being faced uh, with, within Maryland and its communities and how to deal with this on, on a thoughtful, multi-year, multi-decadal um, situation in terms of thinking about solutions that may, would make sense and would last. And she also had spent several years uh, at EPA uh, prior to uh, her work with the state of Maryland, and she also uh, had been the co-founder of the Governor's Institute on Community Design. So she, again, brings a lot of thoughtful background into this very, very important area that we now need in terms of helping our communities across the country. Harriet? Good afternoon. Thanks, all of you, for coming. We're very excited uh, to see all of you here and really thrilled to be talking about our favorite topic, uh, resilience and competition. So this is great. Um, and thank you, Carol. That was a lovely introduction. Now everyone knows I can't keep a job. Um, <laughs> that I bounce around all over the place. But uh, I've only actually been at HUD for just under nine months. Um, so one of the things I didn't know about HUD was how intimately involved it was in disaster recovery. I mean, I had no idea. And uh, what a time to be involved in disaster recovery. The frequency and severity of, of extreme weather events is, uh, is, is, is greatly increasing. Um, you know, those of you who are working here on the Hill know. Um, you know, you, you, you appropriate the funds. HUD has a program, but it's not annually funded. It's funded in the wake of a disaster with a specific appropriations bill that has specific requirements. And our national competition is actually hand, uh, happening under the auspices of one of those bills. Um, I was shocked to find out that HUD had been appropriated more than $45 billion just since 2000 to do long-term disaster recovery. Um, and that's a lot of money, no matter how you look at it. And a lot of places, not every place, but a lot of places have been spending that money to very lovingly rebuild things, just as they were, just where they were. Um, and when you think about, uh, uh, not in the wake of a disaster, the aspirations that many states and communities have for the future to diversify their economy, to create greater opportunity, uh, you know, to, to create amenities and, and make, uh, make places a, a better place to live with more convenience and more choices, um, that's not necessarily how this money is being used. So one of the ideas that really motivates us in doing this competition is, how can we spend that same dollar we were going to spend, but potentially get a different and broader set of benefits from that expenditure? So, um, you know, Hurricane Sandy was a, was a, was a big deal. Um, and uh, it, it started a lot of things in motion here, um, not just for the Rockefeller Foundation and not just for HUD, but, uh, but we have Matt Dalby here from EPA, but he's in some ways a stand-in for many, many other agencies. So uh, around uh, a task force that was formed for Hurricane Sandy, a great number of federal agencies started to work very closely together. Um, you know, you know how it is. Many of you are in government or have worked in government, and that sometimes collaborating is an unnatural act. It's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, uh, you, there's nothing in any of your performance standards that says this is a way you should be doing business, but in fact, you often get a much different, a much better result if you can work together. So that's been a real hallmark. Um, you know, of the work that I think all of us have been doing. Uh, we're doing unnatural things, coordinating across sectors, across jurisdictional boundaries, and across agency lines. Um, and one of those major events that caused a lot of that uh, coming together and coordination was Hurricane Sandy and, and the aftermath. One of the important things um, worth worth mentioning, it, um, we, we talked about Rebuild by Design. It was a competition. It was directed at the design community. So let's talk about that for a second. 
that in and of itself is kind of a bizarre thing because they're not our grant recipients. You know, uh, there might have been money that ultimately went to fund those designs, but they, our money didn't go to designers. Rockefeller's money went to designers. Why would they ask designers to be this kind of weird intermediary between the government, the federal government, and our normal state and local partners? It's because design um, is a way of taking a set of problems and potentially finding a different answer, right? When we started to even do this national competition, I heard from so many people who said, oh, I've got a project for you. Yeah, I've got a project. Let me tell you about my project, because it's been languishing for 10 years, this project that I have. I'm just looking for money to fund it. So I don't need to look at anything else. I don't need to explore options or find partners. You've got money. I've got a project. We're done. No. No. That's not really what we're looking for. So. Even when it comes to uh, a disaster like Hurricane Sandy, um, tremendous flooding, uh, high winds, storm surge, um, it turns out there are lots and lots of ways to address those risks. Many, many different ways. Okay, here's, a, here's some examples of, of what some of those approaches might be. Um, some of them work better in some places than others. Um, but it's also true um, that if one of your strategies is a wall, this, was, this is a great illustration. What else can a wall be? It can be a bench. It can be a, it can be a screen uh, for, for media. You know, it can be, uh, it can be a, uh, uh, a shelter. It can be part of housing. It can be, um, you know, a community gathering place. It can be lots and lots of things, and that's just a wall. So, so the idea is, what are the aspirations and needs of communities? What are they? And if we put all those things on the table, in addition to disaster recovery and resilience, could we get a different answer? And that was really the brilliance behind Rebuild by Design. That's why the designers were the intermediaries, because they went to the community and said, we know what your recovery needs are. Let's talk about your other needs. If we spend this money here, what are the other kinds of benefits that we could get? Um, if, if, uh, if we thought about it differently, right? You can combine these different types of shelter, I'm sorry, these different types of barriers, along with different ways of storing water, uh, along with, uh, with other, um, you know, other amenity-based features, and you can get very, very different things. And you know what? The same, um, uh, you don't have to have the same answer in every community. It can change and, and, uh, and uh, morph in, in different places. You know, this is what we might have expected to see around the island of Manhattan, right? Because that's the kind of thing we know would work, a big seawall. Wouldn't that be great? Um, but that's, that's not what we saw. So uh, uh, there was a project called The Big U, um, and I'm not going to show it to you exactly, but I am going to suggest that, that what The Big U uh, demonstrated was that you can have a different approach in every neighborhood that meets the, the, the needs of that community based on their articulation of what those needs are. It could have a very different character, look very different, provide the same level of protection, but also provide a way to diversify the economy, um, provide new amenities, meet the needs of that community. And I think that is the, the epiphany that we got from Rebuild by Design, and that's the kind of thinking we're hoping to bring to the national competition. There are a couple of other reasons, right, that, that we would do it this way. Are we rolling in money in, at the federal level? Oh, no, we're not. At the state level, at the local level, we are not. So in some ways, it might have been a luxury in the past that we would spend our money silo by silo and not, not only not care if... Uh, if uh, there are other benefits to be had, but maybe even be prohibited from spending the money to get those other benefits by the siloed program, right? Well, we just don't have the luxury of doing that anymore. We have to be smarter about how we spend our money, and for a couple of reasons, right? We need, um, we, we, we need to spend the money uh, much more efficiently, but we're also at a moment when, uh, for a lot of our infrastructure where we know that something we invest in today that we might still be paying for in 20 or 30 years is in real danger of being obsolete. Think about transportation and all the innovations people are talking about in terms of how we use transportation, things that might greatly change our needs for parking on how we calculate capacity, 
on, on, on what, you know, what's the rate of car ownership, think about um, utility infrastructure and how different that might be. If we had more distributed networks and more microgrids, that could be totally different than it is now. So the other thing we have to think about is, can that infrastructure investment have those multiple benefits? If, so if one of those uses ends up being less important over time, that there are these other reasons for paying for that infrastructure. It's also true that we need it to be mutable and adaptable. We know the ways in which some things are going to change, so why don't we build it so that we could adapt that that infrastructure for another use, you know, that, that it has the ability to change. And finally, multiple benefits means multiple funding partners, private partners, other public partners. One of the things we do know for sure that the federal government is going to be shouldering less and less of the cost of these things, right? If we just were to look at that trend, that's likely to be the outcome. So the more benefits we have, the more funding partners we have. So it just makes sense. So. We basically are putting out a billion dollars. A B was an important number for us because a B is attention getting. But let's be clear, it's a carrot. And in the scheme of things, it's a small carrot because what we're looking at trying to leverage is the many billions of dollars that state and local governments spend every year on water and sewer, on roads and bridges, on buildings, on parks, on all kinds of infrastructure. Most of it being spent without any thought about its resilience. So if we can leverage with our billion dollars some thinking about how those other dollars get invested, that is the real objective here. So leverage is a big important part of this competition. Um, we want people, we have, we, we, it's been a long time since some of these disasters, right? Uh, uh, Carol talked about uh, the time frame. It's, uh, it's, sorry, it's calendar year 11 through 13. So uh, people will be applying in 15. So it's several years since the disaster in some cases. And we're, um, you know, we can't use national data to say, oh, these are the most impacted and distressed. I mean, we use that information pretty soon after the disaster, but if there were other impacts, let's say that you had natural resource-based tourism and the job losses and the business closures that, that resulted from, from uh, having some of that natural resource destroyed, um, you, you might not, not have seen those impacts for a couple of years, right? You might still be feeling them today, but you didn't know it right after the disaster. So we're asking that states and localities use their local data to tell us both who's most impacted and distressed and what their unmet needs are that remain from their presidentially declared disaster. So we think that's a fairer way to allocate the money, uh, but it's also but it's a different approach than we've used in the past. We want people to use science and risk to look forward at what are their vulnerabilities um, in the future, what are the risks they face in the future. Uh, we hope that uh, with our partnership with Rockefeller and with other philanthropies that we're looking to try to engage, that we'll be able to provide uh, and encourage resources be spent to, to do this kind of uh, analysis and planning. Uh, we hope uh, a broad set of stakeholders get engaged and we're really encouraging partnerships um, that people really look, public and private sector, um, and, and, and we want to leverage these investments. We're engaging a lot of folks. I mentioned that, um, uh, that, that uh, for Hurricane Sandy, a lot of agencies got together. 17 federal agencies are collaborating with us as part of this national competition. Uh, and we've been preparing them uh, for a lot of questions and maybe some rapid action, because we know one of the hardest things in government is to blend different federal funding streams. So we want to figure out how we can do that more easily. We can leverage each other's money and hopefully get a better result. Um, Sam covered the eligible applicants. It's basically 48 states. Um, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, it's two-thirds of the counties, but the states are really the primary applicants. 17 localities can apply on their own without their states. Um, but the states are going to have to strategically decide which of the eligible counties, they're going to decide, based on the data that's available, which are most impacted and distressed. Okay, so it's a, it's a state call. It's a two-phase competition, and the phases are kind of long. The first phase is six months long, a lot of time for Rockefeller to be able to deliver some technical assistance, a lot of time for other places in the country to kind of catch up uh, to the Sandy-affected region, who had an opportunity to really do some of this design thinking. 
what are the risks and vulnerabilities, what are the types of resources we might already be spending that could be leveraged, you know, what are the kinds of partnerships, what are the things that we aspire to do in our community, and how can, we, how can this money help us to get there. So phase one is not a project. We don't want to see a project. We don't want to talk about a project. We want to hear about an approach. We want to hear about your partners. We want to hear about your risks and vulnerabilities and what you're addressing. Um, and then if we like your competition, if it's highly rated, according to our ranking factors, we'll invite you to participate in phase two, which is projects. Give us a project based on your phase one approach. Show us that it's feasible. If it's for a lot of money, you're going to have to do a benefit cost analysis. Uh, that won't be the only basis for our decision, but we, we, uh, OMB wants us to have you do that. And then we'll uh, award uh, the money at the end of, uh, of the second phase of the competition. Um, it's important that people tie back to their declared disaster. And the only place we are going to be spending our HUD money is in places that, that states and localities identify as most impacted and distressed with remaining unmet needs. We use the language you must address those unmet needs. Normally, we would call for you to satisfy those needs. We deliberately used slightly, um, uh, we, we use different language because we want people to pivot to the future. We want people to look at the future risks and vulnerabilities, but still our money is only going to be spent in the geography that you've identified, that, that states have identified or localities as most impacted and distressed. Now, when, when when states have said to me, wait a minute, you know, what about this big statewide plan I was going to do? I'm like, do it. Like, don't tell me you don't already, you're not already spending money on planning in your state, that you're not spending money on infrastructure in your state. You are already doing that. So you can spend our money potentially in the places you've identified as most impacted and distressed and move that money to other parts of the state. But no one wins this competition without a lot of leverage. You will have to be spending money in a bigger geography and to do more permanent things than our competition is going to allow. That's how you're going to win. Um, here are some of the rating factors. They're slightly, di they're the same factors. They're weighted differently in the two phases of the competition. But you can see 20 points in both phases are for leverage and long-term commitments. We want permanent change out of this. We want, uh, we want a lot of, of, of skin in the game. So what do you get if you win? As much as $500 million, that's the maximum award, so we could do two of those, um, or as little as a million. So we didn't know what we'd get, so we gave it a broad range. Um, but we want people to give us uh, approaches and projects appropriate to the scale of their risk, right? A lot of times we end up doing things at such a small scale. Let's think about a flood control measure that actually exacerbates the risk to the neighboring jurisdictions. We do something here and it just moves the water somewhere else that might be even more vulnerable. So we want to see solutions at the scale of the risk. We've actually gotten an inquiry. I don't know if anything's going to come of it, and I can't say who. But someone has asked us, uh, uh, would we accept a multi-state application? To which we said, yay. We definitely would accept that. So it, it gives me hope that people are understanding what this is and, and hopefully um, uh, you know, applying um, uh, a, a, you know, a lot of their effort to do something exciting. So uh, I'll just close by saying Rockefeller's been a great partner. We're excited to be working with them and that they, um, they also are holding out the prospect that while HUD will pick winners in collaboration with our federal partners who are going to be part of our decision panel, it's possible Rockefeller could pick different winners on their own and do things to support other interesting projects. And so that gives another dimension uh, to this competition, that uh, there might be something in it for you, even if you don't technically win the federal competition. So tell everyone they should play. Thank you. Thanks, Harriet. We'll now turn to Matt Dalby, who is the Director of the Office of Sustainable Communities at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And Matt has um, been at EPA for a number of years, and I think uh, very interestingly, he also comes from a background in academia where he was an assistant professor at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at Jackson State University. 
and he is the author of a work entitled Regional Visionaries and Metropolitan Boosters. Now, this was looking particularly at decentralization, regional planning, and parkways, but I think we sort of, in terms of thinking about the, the whole topic under discussion today, regional visionaries and metropolitan boosters, a really important piece of our whole theme of how we need to think about going into the future and tackling the challenges that we are facing today. And EPA on October 23rd invited communities to apply for technical assistance through EPA's Building Blocks for Sustainable Communities program. So this is another opportunity for communities to look with a new eye towards greater innovation to help themselves become more resilient. Matt? All right, good afternoon. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate that. I hadn't thought about that book for a while, so I appreciate you talking about that. Um, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, listening to Sam and Harriet speak, um, you know, we, we live in the physical world. I mean, it probably would have been better if I could sort of jump in and weave in some of the work that EPA does as Sam and Harriet were, were speaking, but um, the physical world doesn't work that way. I mean, I think there are uh, a number of things that, that, that came up that, you know, we, we get involved in um, at EPA. We get involved in unnatural acts, like working with other agencies, and we've been doing that uh, for about the 20 years of our, of our program. Um, we get involved in design issues. Um, we get involved in innovative and creative solutions, um, particularly around uh, the built environment. I think that uh, most of us would recognize that. Uh, we've been building under uh, development patterns in a particular way since about World War II. I mean, I think that's the, when I think of history, I think about that, you know, that space. And we've been building in a way that has led to decentralization, that has led to more pavement, that has led to, uh, uh, this investment in, 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 in previously developed uh, communities. Uh, it's led to more time in the car. It's led, led to less walking. It's led to all these sorts of things. And um, right now, many of us who are working in this field are trying to figure out what are the new creative, innovative ways to grow that deal with the challenges that are created by what I just described. Um, you know, uh, at EPA, we work on leveraging uh, other agencies' dollars because we have very few. Um, we also recognize that um, design innovation and creative thinking about the next increment of growth in communities can lead to catalytic investments. And as Harriet described, the federal government is not building the great high schools that we built during the New Deal any longer, the buildings that actually value our kids. We're building uh, uh, things with much less money and we're building them in ways uh, perhaps that are not as good as they used to be. Uh, but we know that good design and the right policies and the right codes when they're put in place will spur on um, really good development because that's where the market wants to be. I mean, you don't have to pick up, you know, you can pick up the paper every single day or read it online every single day and you hear about the changing uh, 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 lifestyles that uh, millennials and those of us who are in the baby boom are looking for. Um, so our office, my office at EPA, um, works in that space. And uh, so where am I? So here's the clicker. So here I am. So um, uh, again, because I couldn't jump in at, 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 at previous times, I'm just going to tell you the story of our office and how we are doing uh, work in this space. Um, uh, uh, you know, we've been around since the mid '90s um, when Harriet actually um, uh, founded our program, uh, and we've been working with uh, um, local governments and states and other federal uh, 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 partners um, to figure out how to how to grow better. I mean, I, as many of you know, the Environmental Protection Agency's mission is to protect public health and the environment. We do this primarily um, through uh, a regulatory regime, but. We all know that the way we use our land impacts the quality of our environment, and that's the space that we work in. We're a, um, a voluntary program. We have no regulatory authority to do our work, uh, but uh, we have a high demand for our work, and we do it, and we've been doing it, you know, again, since the mid-'90s uh, in, th in three different ways. One, we've been working on uh, changing the conversation, making sure that communities that want to grow better have the tools and ideas they can uh, uh, adopt um, to grow better. Um, we uh, sponsor this national, uh, the New Partners for Smart Growth Conference, which will be held this year in this region, uh, in Baltimore, uh, in January of 20, uh, 2015. We have a Smart Growth Achievement Award uh, 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 program uh, where we've been 
looking at and, and rewarding uh, communities with awards uh, who are doing really good job, a really good job in protecting the environment, growing economies, um, um, supporting better community outcomes and public health outcomes. And we have a, um, a whole set of publications that we've been working on for the last 20 years that address everything from green infrastructure to codes and ordinances to equitable development uh, to small towns and rural communities that want to grow better. We also help communities. Uh, uh, that want our help, um, you know, uh, as I described before, the development pattern that we've had since World War II, uh, you know, has not been so good for the environment. But uh, it's the exact development pattern that our codes and policies at the state level, at the local level, and even at the federal level um, allow us to build. And so many communities are trying to figure out how can we change the policies that we have that lead us uh, to have a development pattern that is not necessarily good for the economy, not necessarily good for the environment, um, communities, and public health. Um, our office, which is very small, we have about 30 people, um, a extramural budget of about $2 million a year. Um, we spend about half of those dollars in providing direct technical assistance, either to communities or to states. And here are some of the, uh, the programs that we have. Our smart growth implementation assistance uh, program is sort of our uh, flagship program where we work on cutting edge issues in communities to help them figure out, again, how to grow better. Um, Harriet mentioned the Governor's Institute on Community Design, or I think Carol did when describing Harriet. That's one of our grant programs where we work directly with governors and governor staff um, to figure out what policies need to be put in place to help change development patterns. Um, we work in, in capital cities with Green America's Capitals, and then I'll describe a little bit about our building blocks program uh, in a moment. Um, but we also, um, Use other people's money. You can see we've worked with FEMA, USDA, Appalachian Regional Commission, Delta Regional Authority, and use their dollars to get into communities that matter to them to work on the codes and ordinances and strategies that can help communities grow better. We also work with partners. Um, my office is the lead uh, office at EPA on the Partnership for Sustainable Communities, which was started by um, Secretary LaHood, Secretary Donovan, in, in uh, the early summer of 2009, uh, our three agencies have been working together on um, sustainable communities grants, on the building blocks projects, on Tiger and such since 2009. It's still going very strong. Um, <laughs> my initial start uh, working on the resiliency or the adaptation or the, the what do you do after a disaster actually started in 2007 after tornadoes knocked down the town of Greensburg, Kansas. One of my colleagues invited me out to speak about how to rebuild in a more sustainable way. It led to uh, my office working with six communities in Iowa after floods and tornadoes hit there in 2008. Uh, and it led to a, a, a memorandum of agreement with, uh, with FEMA to work on long-term recovery and hazard mitigation. And the place that we started, I mean, I always wonder like what would have happened if you know, if Sandy had happened earlier, or Irene had happened earlier, but we got our start in working in Iowa. And we were brought in because, as Harriet sort of described, um, when communities were rebuilding after disasters, they were rebuilding to where they were before, except when there were, you know, some differing circumstances. We were asked to come in and say, hey, how can we work on making sure the comprehensive plan is part of the recovery? Because comprehensive plans look towards the future and how you can grow and have an economy um, that could be sustainable over time. Wouldn't it be good if recovery and comprehensive plans were, were worked on together? And we've continued that um, relationship with FEMA. We've worked in Joplin, Missouri. We've worked in Spirit Lake Nation, which is a tribal community in North Dakota. Um, and uh, much of many of my colleagues in our Region 2 office out of New York who are working on the Sandy recovery are working underneath this MOA that we started with FEMA. Um, we're working with other agencies like um, GSA, um, and then we're right in the middle of a number of these other um, uh, 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 administrative initiatives like the Strong City, Strong Communities Initiative, Urban Waters, uh, and a whole host of other ones that I think arguably um, got a little bit of their model from the Partnership for Sustainable Communities, which was started in 2009. Um, the issue, though, is, as I, as I just said a, a couple of moments ago, um, our budget is very small. There's a lot of demand for the work that we do. And we've been wrestling over the last few years, how do we um, take the idea that we can only work with a certain number of communities each year, even if we do partner with other agencies, and get that to scale? I mean, how do we, how do we work with the, you know, 
tens of thousands of communities across the country that, that, that want our help. And one of the ways we've begun to do that is by taking our technical assistance, turning it into tools, and then going into communities, maybe 25 to 30 communities a year, as opposed to seven or eight communities that we used to do. So we can go in for one day, short, quick hit type of um, workshops. Uh, and that's what led to our Building Blocks for Sustainable Communities program. Um, as you can see up here, I mean, uh, the idea with tools are that um, communities come to us when they learn a little bit about the tools, we bring the tool to the community um, and we demonstrate to those communities what the next steps would be in either changing their codes, changing their policies, attracting development, um, talking to other federal agencies about implementation dollars. So it's, it, I never really figured this out, like how do you follow this and follow the things that are going on up there? Um, so the, the bottom line is our, our, our Building Blocks program let, allows us to get into more communities every year. Um, it allows us to bring our federal partners in who are the implementing agencies. We are often not um, implementers. Um, it helps us figure out what the strategy a community could adopt um, to get better outcomes out of um, their growth and development uh, 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 regime that they're under. Uh, and then it also allows us to sort of test out and perhaps allow these tools to be used by other organizations like trade associations that work with local governments like NAIC or NATO or ICMA and that sort of thing. Generally, when we bring a tool, when we bring a tool to a community, we have a homework assignment for the community that, you know, they, they, gives, they give us the codes, uh, they give us the policies that they have in place. Um, we uh, uh, talk through what we hope that uh, the community could get out of the tool. Um, we have an agenda, we bring you know, a presentation, we try to get some sort of hands-on uh, exercise going. We spend a day there, uh, and when I say we, we bring we have um, you know a team of experts from around the country that we bring in through contracts, uh, and then we come up with a next step sort of process. Um, in 2015, um, as Carol mentioned, we uh, we announced that we uh, are, 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 are have our building box program. It's out on the street. We have. Um, Request for letters of intent. I think there are a number of them in the table outside. It's about five pages. It describes the different tools that we have this year. And I'm just going to talk through the first four really quickly. But um, we have a bike sharing uh, tool that we can uh, bring to the table. Um, we have an equitable development tool, an infill development tool, um, a tool used for small cities and rural areas, and then the flood resilience uh, tool, which I'll talk about in more detail. But just real quick, the bike share uh, tool will allow um, a community to figure out the feasibility, um, what types of planning uh, processes need to be put forward. Um, in the equitable development tool, I mean, this has been a big issue for us over the last um, a couple years. Um, there is a perception that sometimes when communities rebuild existing places, there are gentrification and displacement pressures and things like that. So we have worked with our Office of Environmental Justice to try to figure out ways to mitigate uh, gentrification and displacement um, as appropriate and um, help communities grow in a way that all communities, uh, all parts of the community can benefit from that growth. Um, we've put together an infill development tool for distressed cities. This came out of some work we did in Fresno, uh, California, which was part of the Strong Cities, Strong Communities um, uh, initiative. Um, and this is a really important tool because many distressed cities are trying to figure out how to grow their economy. And if they grow their economy in ways that continue to leave out their downtowns, they're gonna be missing out on opportunities to, uh, uh, to make sure that the, the actual growth and development that does come can be supportive of the entire, of the entire community. Um, so we developed this in Fresno and now we're gonna deliver it uh, 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 this year. Uh, and then our rural um, communities and small cities uh, 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 tool uh, is aimed at you know re you know recognizing that um, all of our work is not necessarily going to be done in urban areas, but we we do have the opportunity to help small communities grow. And there's there's a big economic development component of this because many of our rural communities across the country are the ones that are suffering the most um, from the economic downturn and the change of the economy and change in technology, um, certainly over the last couple of ge generations. Um, and then, so finally, I'll talk quickly about um, our flood resilience, riverine, and, and coastal communities tool. Um, this tool came out of uh, a, a larger project that we did in Vermont um, after Irene, which I, I, it's funny. So I've been to Greensburg just after that, the tornado. I was in Iowa just after that tornado. And I was in, I was speaking at the American Planning Association meeting up in Vermont like two weeks after Irene. So I guess don't invite me to places because I wind up, you wind up usually having a disaster. Exactly. I'm, a, I'm a disaster waiting to happen, right? Um, so anyway, so, so the state of Vermont asked us to come in to help um, figure out how um, 
to use smart growth or sustainable community strategies as a rebuilding tool um, after a disaster. And uh, so what they asked us to do was look at their local plans and their policies and their codes, which are things that I, 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 I described just before, and also to look at what state policies and what federal policies were going to influence the way they rebuilt themselves. And um, so we did that. Um, and you know, just, you know, this is the best graphic that describes the work that we did. Um, you know, uh, by looking at the comp plan, by looking at hazard mitigation plans and development regulations, we were able to um, come up with this basically a checklist that said, here are the considerations that you should, that sh that you should um, consider um, when you're rebuilding. And if, if your comp plan doesn't allow you to begin to think about safe areas to grow or ways to, con you know, conserve some land around your rivers, then here are ways to change it. And so, um, we, del we, you know, we delivered that assistance, and uh, uh, we looked at particularly at two communities, which I can't remember. Sarah, do you remember which two communities we looked at in Vermont? Anyway, it's it's, it's in the report, which is which is available. Oh, actually, the checklist is outside. Um, anyway, so we looked at two communities, and then uh, uh, we realized that this is the type of checklist that could be delivered through our building box program. And so right now, uh, it's one of the tools, the tool that emerged out of this Vermont work, um, that is going to allow communities to begin um, uh, to assess before the disaster how they could grow more resiliently. What codes are going to be barriers to allowing them to grow more resiliently? And I mean, I think the the the, the probably the main reason that I was in, invited here to speak about this is because if communities begin to use this type of checklist, whether it's through our assistance or on their own or through other um, organizations, then um, the multiple positive benefits they would get out of investments that would be made as they grow in a more resilient way, would feed into and fit into some of the things that Harriet and Sam were talking about earlier, right? Let's figure out good places to grow. Let's figure out what policies will allow communities to, 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 you know, to, to deal with wet weather, weather events. Let's figure out how um, infrastructure can be uh, uh, deployed and, and, and brought into communities so you get multiple positive community outcomes. And we feel very strongly that this tool is a first step in many communities. If they begin, did begin to use this, and we'll find out, we'll see how, how it's used. But if you begin to use this, then you're gonna have a better sense of the, where your dollars should go and your, your investments should go to grow in a more resilient way. Um, I'll end on uh, this last slide here. Um, the deadline for applications, and the application is very short, it's a couple pages. Um, it's, it's next week. Um, Sarah Dale here, Sarah, raise your hand. Sarah is our project officer for this uh, in my office at EPA. Um, if you have questions, Sarah's uh, 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 contact information is down below. Okay, so good, thanks. Okay, thank you. So let us begin our discussion. And I should also just ask our uh, panelists if there were other points that you thought of during others' presentations, please be sure to, to raise those. And if you could just identify yourself when you ask your question or make a comment. Do you have any discussion? Go ahead. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm consultant. Uh, to what extent do you bring in the internet to let people get together their funding and get together their communities on common up? So, okay, do you want to repeat the question? Um, yeah. Okay, sort of. To what extent do you use the Do you want to internet? put your microphone? To what extent do you use the internet um, to uh, get people to uh, think about ways to combine funding and to uh, engage community stakeholders? Um, so we don't prescribe any particular way to get people together. And uh, as we mentioned, it's a kind of a long competition. We're at the very early stages of it. So actually, Sam uh, and the Rockefeller Foundation are hosting next week a resilient summit. Um, uh, where every eligible applicant has been invited. And so uh, engagement strategies are going to be one of the topics that, that are going to be discussed, as is uh, uh, financing uh, resilience. So uh, those will be among uh, the topics and the ways to, uh, to connect. People will certainly be part of that. Sam? Just turning on my microphone. Thanks for the question. Um, there's a, a, a general uh, question about how do you 
sort of catalyze collective action that I think is, is part of Bob's question. How do you get people engaged with different kinds of ideas and thinking across traditional silos? Uh, and the internet does have a sort of leveling factor in terms of making lots of information available to many people. Uh, you know, Matt is describing the various tools that his organization is putting together. These are, these are you know, scalable globally immediately with the push of a publish button. So that's, that's an opportunity that we have as people that are working in this field to really meet, uh, reach, reach broader and broader uh, constituents. For the foundation, uh, you know, we use... Um, the internet in many different ways, um, but I, I'll mention just specifically tied to this process one thing that we are doing um, in uh, preparing these um, uh, this technical assistance for the communities uh, that are eligible to compete in HUD's competition. Um, we recognize the opportunity to pull in, you know, the, the decades of experience that we've had in working with communities around the world to, to make them more resilient, to help them grow to become more resilient, and really codify that into a curriculum that will be deployed through these um, workshops that we're going to run regionally. But there's no reason that can't be deployed in other ways. So we're actually launching in December a new website that's going to be a version of that entire curriculum that we uh, will be delivering at those, uh, at those regional academies uh, that will be accessible to anyone in the entire world. So we see it as a key way of, of sparking innovative ideas. That's how you reach people that have the next best idea oftentimes. Um, but of course, you do have to couple that with really meaningful one-on-one -on -one and group engagement, as, as Harriet mentioned. Um, in the past, uh, a lot of the uh, progress that's been made in looking after the general health, safety, and welfare of the population have been uh, actually accomplished through regulation. And I don't see anywhere mentioned specifically. I know that uh, regulation has been given a bad name regulatory. Probably it's going to suffer further. But um, why isn't there more attention placed on either innovation in the regulatory process or uh, expansion of regulatory approaches? So we could have had a panel just about regulation. There's a lot that's happening in the regulatory world. There's some things happening at HUD with respect to um, uh, our Part 55 floodplain um, guidelines and, and other things, building codes. Um, uh, all of those things are happening. Um, and I expect to see potential regulatory reform coming out of the collaboration among the federal agencies, where we look to try to make it possible to do that unnatural act of combining federal funding streams and aligning um, entitlement requirements and other sorts of things. Um, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that we meant to uh, suggest that, that competition uh, and, and this idea of uh, distributing money in this way is the uh, is the sine qua non of of, uh, of reform or innovation. But uh, I will tell you, I'm um, I'm not personally writing any regulations at HUD, um, so I probably wouldn't be the best person to talk about it. But we d but there definitely is regulatory activity happening in every agency to make some things that are hard to do now easier, and to um, and and to add some requirements that also help. Uh, help protect property, life, and safety. Um, can, Go ahead, uh, Matt. My own. Okay. So I'll just add this. I mean, one of the things that uh, I, I, I don't personally write any regulations either, um, but um, uh, one of the things that we are doing under our MOA with FEMA is helping them, helping FEMA rewrite the guidance that FEMA delivers to states that then states use to get communities to write hazard mitigation plans. Right, and that guidance, the things that we are adding to that guidance is, you know, respect land use planning, um, uh, think about comprehensive planning, think about future economic development opportunities, and, and, and get that incorporated into the hazard mitigation plans, which has not been uh, prior to that. And um, arguably, there are hazard mitigation plans all across the country that were written without that. And, and once this work gets done, they will be written with, in, in keeping with economic development strategies, in keeping with comprehensive planning and land use, and incorporating um, uh, concepts around extreme weather events, of which we are seeing more at this point. Okay. 
Okay, back here first. Oh, go ahead, Sam. Uh, I'll just add that I think we can all agree that, that it's a good thing that private foundations aren't regulating everyday Americans. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but with that, I just want to underscore, uh, you know, th there's, there is a lot of innovative work being, on, being done in that space. Again, that's not really the, the focus of, of this, but just to emphasize, the leverage component of the National Disaster Resilience Competition includes and, and is open enough to capture the idea of regulatory reform within states and within communities to count towards uh, the quality of their application. That's part of the kind of action that we're asking communities to take. Um, that, that's part of a coordinated plan and effort uh, that could, you know, that would also include potentially HUD funding through the DR program. So, it would just seem that this kind of effort would help inform regulatory or or innovative regulatory approaches as we move into the future as well. Uh, back here first, okay. Uh, David Hattis, the Institute for Building Technology and my question relates to the recovery and its relation to the additional uh, benefits that was mentioned. The NOFA talks a lot about relating to the specific disaster declaration, but it also has words about multi-hazard. It doesn't use the word mitigation for a variety of reasons. But my question relates to an example, let's say, in Tennessee or in Arkansas, where the disasters that were declared were flood-related or tornado-related. But perhaps the largest hazard that they, the Madrid earthquake zone, relates to earthquakes. And there hasn't been an earthquake declaration in, in that region. Uh, would any planning that emphasized or included earthquake mitigation in those particular areas come under the uh, uh, additional funding rather than the HUD funding, or could it be included under the HUD funding? So, it really depends on the, on the specific circumstances. Um, but that condition exists in every single state, right? That in the three-year period, they were hit, uh, states were hit by uh, a finite number of disasters and they're subject to more. So different parts of the state were hit by different things. So um, it's up to the state or locality to tie back their unmet need, right, from one of their declared disasters. Some of those unmet needs might relate to environmental impairment. We, we're very specific about that in the NOFA. They might re, uh, relate to uh, uh, economic distress that might result from that. So let's say one of the examples is uh, uh, um, res natural resource-based tourism. Um, I think I might have mentioned it earlier that uh, that if one of the things that happened uh, is that you, uh, I, I said the, the job losses and the business closures might have happened a year or two years after the disaster occurred. If that's your single, um, you know, if that's your uh, your primary uh, sector that serves your community, that one of the ways you might address the the your unmet need uh, related to job losses and unemployment, it might be to diversify the economy, right? So that then gives you some other openings. Some of that economic diversification might be to address other types of risks. So it's, um, it's a competition that, that has these prerequisites. You have to tie back, uh, but we do want people to be looking forward. And if it's, if it's in that same geography, looking at future risks, um, it's, it's absolutely possible to look at resilience to future risks in the same geography where you have unmet disaster recovery needs. And just to, just to add a little bit, more and push a little bit with what Harriet's saying. This is really where the opportunity for technical assistance to the communities, I think, adds a lot of value to, to this because there's the opportunity to think really creatively if there's a long tail of unmet economic need tied back to the flood event in that particular state. Um, you know, how could we uh, diversify the economy and simultaneously have a co-benefit of, of protecting our communities from future earthquake. Like that's a perfect design problem. And that's where we can come in and really work with communities and try to identify those opportunities and build really comprehensive projects that have these multiple co-benefits that are making communities more resilient. 
Because at the end of the day, we don't know what's coming next. That's the whole problem, right? <laughs> so it's the, the opportunity to uh, become more resilient is, is about taking together everything that's happened in the past, everything that could happen in the future, be smart about identifying the, me the risks and the meaningful, uh, that are meaningful and really design accordingly. So let me just also be, cl be clear about this because uh, Sam and I are sitting up here together. Um, our competition is a federal government competition. Uh, we love Rockefeller. They will not be choosing the winners of our competition. Um, they are running their own technical assistance, and uh, other federal agencies and HUD folks will be there, but it's, it is, uh, in some cases, but it is uh, Rockefeller's technical assistance. So, like I say, they might pick their own winners and fund their own projects that have nothing to do with anything we decide to fund, um, but our hope is that anyone who applies for this, in this competition in phase one, is going to end up with a product that is going to be useful to them, whether they go on in the competition or not, because it'll, they will have gone through an effort to look at what their risks and vulnerabilities are, what are the sources of funding in their jurisdiction that, be, that can be used to address these things, and hopefully it'll give them a framework for better decision making going forward, um, whether or not they end up getting federal funding for it. Great. Okay. Okay, here, then I'll come back. Yeah, I'm also a consultant. Uh, it seems to me that that what all of what you just what you talked about today really talks to is something that's been missing in recoveries um, a lot in the past, and that is a visioning exercise, some kind of opportunity to uh, to assist the community to, to, to think before they leap uh, in recovery. And it's always the most difficult time to even do that sort of thing. But um, I remember after the great we went flood, uh, there was the little town of Valmeyer, uh, Illinois, uh, that needed to take a great leap. In fact, what they ultimately did was go 200 feet elevation up the hill. It just completely removed the town and, and rebuilt. It's really frightening now, uh, but it, but they needed uh, help with that. And actually, there were some federal agencies at that time, Department of Energy, for instance, to help them think through a new energy system uh, for the town, which is far more efficient than the utilities they had. But um, that, I think, is what is so inspiring. And what you just what you just talked about um, the possibility. I don't know whether that could be. Institutionalized, you're probably not thinking about that at this point. You're just trying to get the project done. But uh, those are the thoughts. Well, thank you for that comment. I think what Matt Dalby said just a moment ago, uh, it, you know, is also true. In some cases communities did have a vision, they had a comprehensive plan, they had aspirations. It was actually the federal government who said, you know, you can't spend any more money. If you haven't adopted a new code, you certainly couldn't build the a safer code now. And I think those are the kinds of things that are changing. And the idea that you could spend a dollar and get several dollars worth of benefit, now, I mean, I think we're, we're all getting acculturated to that idea as being a good one. So it's, it's both what, uh, what, what communities should be encouraged to do, think about the future, right? But it's also uh, getting the federal government to recognize the aspirations and the goals of places and saying, if we can meet our primary objective, why do we want to prevent these other benefits from also being... Uh, you know, uh, also being uh, realized. So I think I think we're both learning. Constant learning practice. Okay. Can I, can I actually sure. add one more thing to that? Because the, the the question about how do you institutionalize this practice is really core for the foundation's question about how do you really scale this up. And uh, oftentimes when I think about this partnership with with HUD and, and the opportunity for the foundation, this is an occasion to have this conversation with 67 communities around, around the country. And we're actually inviting the other two states, uh, Nevada and South Carolina, so we're gonna have the conversation with them as well. Um, and, 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 and really to, to invite them to increase their capacity to, to do this on an ongoing basis. 
Um, and, and, you know, success for the foundation means, yes, there will be wonderful ideas and proposals that, that come through HUD's competition. But if we leave sort of a legacy in these places where there's these multidisciplinary teams that are thinking about resilience and really looking to the future and are connected to the local research institutions and are talking to designers and are having these conversations across agencies, that's, 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 that's the opportunity. Um. Yeah, I, I would just like to uh, say something. The creativity that you all have demonstrated, um, with some experience of the rigidity of federal bureaucracy, the ability to knit together programs like community block grants and disaster recovery and so on, and to collaborate, as you are doing with the uh, Rock um, this program represents a, a tremendous leap in um, innovation and creativity already. And uh, so I think that there are, there are many people at the local level and uh, in organizations that have been involved in disaster recovery over a long time um, that appreciate very much the openness and the ability to understand relationships and siloed and segregated approaches in the past. And so um, just want to applaud that effort as far as it's going. Thank you. That's really great to hear. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to uh, the, the, uh, the current OMB director, who's the former um, uh, secretary uh, at HUD. And we also have some really great new leadership in the form of Julian Castro a former mayor of San Antonio. I come from local and state government. Uh, we've been heavily um, influenced by the advice of the state, local, and tribal leaders task force, um, looking at, at climate and, uh, and resilience issues. Um, you know, I think it's really about doing what states and localities are already having to do, which is to be much more commonsensical about how money gets spent and really trying to get, you know, get as much benefit out of it um, as they possibly can. So I think we're basically trying to uh, do everything we can do to be responsive to that. But uh, it's, it's, it's good to hear that, uh, that, that, you, that, you, that you think it's a good idea. Thank you. Great. Hey, did you have a comment over here? Go ahead. Yeah. In the mm -hmm. uh, with Raymer, with the American Society of is there funding built into any of these programs? Let me just say this. We've had a lot of success with our report card for America's infrastructure, which is great infrastructure. Is there funding built into any of these programs to look at how these projects perform or hold up uh, on the next, when the next disaster comes? Um, so, so the NOFA makes really excellent bedtime reading. It'll take you several days to get through it. It'll, but, but, you, but you'll sleep well. Um, but there's actually a very specific section in there. So one of the things that, uh, uh, that we're interested in is ecosystem services, or what people call green infrastructure. Um, and one of the, the reasons why it's been hard to use in some cases, even though it, it's one of those things that provides multiple benefits, it can cool cities, it can manage stormwater, it, can, it could uh, create recreational and transportation opportunities, is that the performance uh, data is is spotty, and the and the transferability to different soil types in different regions is is also not known. So you know we'll give people credit, um, you know if they uh, partner with research institutions and collect that performance data right as part of a long term commitment to the field and furthering our knowledge in this effort. So uh, in in some small way, yes. Uh, we had two last questions. Okay. that 
that could be addressed that to, to sort of help, you know, at the federal level to help do, to help you do what you're doing. Um, and one that I'm thinking of, I was interested in the MO, EPA, MOA with FEMA. Um, are you looking at procurement specifications, for example, how FEMA, um, decide what kind of disaster housing um, it wants, uh, things like that. There was an alternative housing pilot program, HUD and FEMA work together. Um, there are lots of good examples, like in the city cottage, the Eco cottage that came out of that. Does FEMA now ask for better, or do you know if they can pass a program? So, okay. Could you put your mic on? Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. I appreciate it. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about, um, you know, disaster recovery is that it often comes in different chunks, right? So there's the, imme in the immediate emergency, res the immediate response. Um, and uh, I think housing folks right after the, 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 the disaster is the immediate response. I feel even bad about saying this, but I mean, our our work with FEMA comes in at the next step, sort of the long term recovery, um, and uh, uh, so we are primarily working on long term recovery and, and hazard mitigation. Um, I know there are other parts of of EPA that have worked on sort of energy efficiency and and, and things, and I think that uh, there are other organizations that we've worked with over the years that worked on the Katrina Cottage. I think that's what it, what it was called. Um, I mean, Harry, do you you have probably had a little bit of experience with that, or? I mean, we're doing a lot of that kind of work in different parts of, of HUD um, mm -hmm. to, to look for those opportunities, and we're hoping we see innovation. Uh, I actually, earlier this morning, was talking to the CEO Summit that's the building industry. It's NIBS along with the AIA and, uh, and all the other design and engineering professions, but about the need for innovation, mm -hmm. um, that, that part of, uh, you know, part of uh, what you know, what we need to demand and require is uh, multi-purpose infrastructure. We need buildings that can swim, right? right? I, th I think drywall is one of the most ironically termed things, <laughs> right. uh, you know, right? That, that, uh, that I guess maybe not. It can only be dry. If it ever gets wet at all, it's just no good. But, you know, th I think there's a lot that we can be doing in the building materials uh, space uh, and in the types of market signals we send, I mean, right now, for better or worse, um, you know, we've so averaged out uh, the the uh, with insurance, uh, with with average premiums and other things that that you know nobody, no individual property owner gets a signal about whether there's uh, something they can do to reduce their risk and and no financial incentive to you know, to pay for it. A risk-adjusted premium would actually create that incentive and potentially a whole new industry. Uh, mm -hmm. there, and there, there are those things, and those things are potentially changing, but um, I'm, this is a competition that's also a little bit about scale. So, um, so we need to do work at every scale, and uh, some of it at, at the scale of a single building and some of it at the scale of a large landscape to get the kind of results that we need. Can I just add like one other uh, piece of, one other uh, project that we are working on is, uh, we're working to figure out what types of codes and policies all the way down to the building codes that localities could adopt or make changes to in order to adapt better. And it's a project that we're in the middle of and we should probably talk about that because we're looking for some uh, additional expertise on it. So.
um, innovations in that area, but by and large, the industry is not as resilient as it could be. And so I would just respectfully request that that sort of get thought about in terms of, you know, silos within the agency. So, anyway, but thank you so much. I just, I was so, so delighted to hear what you guys are doing. Go ahead. Did you yeah, I'll just make one, com one comment, more of a plug. Uh, but there's, um, we have a, a uh, a grant and a partnership we made with EcoTrust, which some of you guys might know. It's an organization based in the Pacific Northwest. And we're creating with them uh, a internet platform actually called the Resilience Exchange. That's also going to be rolling out in the next couple months. But I think you can get a preview of it at resilienceexchange.org. Um, this is actually a, a tool that enables people all over the world who have good ideas, like the ones that were just being described, to actually share their ideas, break them down into their component parts, uh, and then actually lets people that are thinking about these problems really rejigger and reconfigure the different building blocks that actually make the idea resilient to hopefully generate new and innovative solutions. So that's something that we're going to make available to everyone um, and hopefully will do some of the work that you're describing. Great. That's, that's great to hear about. And I must say, with regard to all of these uh, efforts, it's something that we are hoping to um, stay in touch with you all on so that we can sort of bring these articles of progress and the stories forward um, in terms of what are seen as, as additional unmet needs, how communities, how states are interested in moving forward, what the role of different entities can be so that we can truly optimize um, everyone's efforts to address these really, really important uh, problems and, and to make sure that everybody does have access to these tools. Um, so thank you all very, very much, and thank you all very much for coming and for contributing to this very rich discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye.